one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, or at your word, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Wow. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. And I'd like you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, don't quit. Help is on the way. Come on, one more time. Don't quit. Help is on the way. Give God some praise up in here. Jesus is in Capernaum teaching by the lake of Gennesaret, sometimes called a connection with the Sea of Galilee. So that all the crowd could hear him teaching, he, he got into Simon Peter's boat, who had just returned from fishing, and they were washing their nets. Peter was okay with Jesus using his boat as a pulpit. To teach the people, after all, he was rabbi, he was teacher. But in verses 4 and 5, Peter clearly has some issues with Jesus telling him to go back and fish some more. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water, let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, or at your word, I'll let down to the nets. I'm sure Peter was thinking to himself, Jesus, by trade, you are a carpenter, not a fisherman. Stay out the fishing business. I can hear him thinking, what gives you the right to tell me how to do my job? Many people in church are the same way. Pastor, I will listen to you in church. I'll consider what you're preaching, then forget what you said, <laughs> and make no application to my personal life. You know the old joke goes like this. All of you have heard it. How was church today? Good. Well, what did he preach about? I don't know, <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> That's like looking at myself in this Hand mirror, getting a clear understanding of what I look like, and then put the hand mirror down, walk away, and forget what I look like. That's how we sometimes deal with the Word of God. It's just, what well, is what we're supposed to be. It's Sunday, so I'm supposed to be in church. But you're not here just because it's Sunday. You're here to be fed from the Word of God. You're here to hear things that will change your life. Hallelujah. And I want someone to know today and share it on television. God's Word is meant to interfere in your job, in your home, in your leisure, in your everyday activities and decisions. God wants to get in your business. I love it when the members at Victory, those you watch on television, I get it often, they'll say to me after sermon or Bible class, Pastor, will you get out of my house? 
Or they'll say, how did you know that was going on in my job? How did you know? That's the Holy Spirit. I don't have to know any. The Spirit knows. And the Spirit is moving. And the, and the Spirit is working through us weak vessels of clay to strengthen and encourage God's people. We think like Peter that we know what we know. But ladies and gentlemen, think closely about this. Peter is the expert fisherman. I can hear Peter now going, you got that right. I've, I've been on the job for 20, 25 years. I'm an expert. I didn't train other fishermen. But Peter, we got one problem. Though you are an expert. Well, what's that? You ain't caught nothing, man. <laughs> you, you are an expert, but you ain't caught nothing. You got a real problem here. You see, most people, they work just hard enough to not get fired and get paid just enough money not to quit. <laughs> but, but not Peter and fellow, his fishermen, they had work all night. Quite nothing. I'm, 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 I'm going all up in your house. You might as well get me somewhere to sleep because I'm going quick as I can in it. Most people don't live to work. They work to make a living. Work is effort applied towards some end. The Greek word for work implies to become weary in well-doing. If we are not making progress, if we don't see results from our work, we become discouraged. And we want to quit and give up. I wish I had an amen. I know I'm talking to somebody. You done worked hard and finished school and you still don't have no job just like Tommy. You done worked hard to save marriage and you're sitting here right now divorced. You have worked hard to take care of your body and the doctor still said you got some disease. You have worked hard to make ends meet, but they just don't ever seem to quite meet. Some of you have worked hard, you're still living from paycheck to paycheck. But I want to encourage you today. Tell your neighbor again, just in case they weren't listening, say, don't quit. Don't quit. Help is on the way. <laughs> oh, I'm going to give God praise up in here today. Look at what the Bible tells us in Galatians 6 and 9. The Bible tells us to not become weary in doing good or in doing well. For in due season we shall reap. We're going to have a harvest. If you don't faint, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't give up. Winners are not those who never fail, but those who never quit. Since this is football season, I want to quote the, the late great Vince Lombardi, head coach of the Green Bay Packers in the 1960s. Led the team to three straight league championships, dominated football in the 60s, as most of the men here know. He makes this comment that is profound. He says, once you learn to quit, it becomes a habit. Once you learn to quit, it's a habit. See, one of the things the devil just wants you to do is simply quit. Just to give up. Because nothing further can happen when you quit and sit down and be like Harry Hippie. Who Bobby Womack said, I like to help a man when he's down. But how can I help him when he's laying on the ground? When you work hard with no results, quitting can become easy and logical. And that's what most people do. Most people, they just quit. Even though Peter had finished fishing for the day, <laughs> Jesus said, go back out. Conrail, Conrad Hilton of the Hilton uh, chain of hotels said, and I quote, success seems to be connected with action. Successful people keep moving. They make mistakes, but they don't quit. 
That's one of the keys I've learned in my life. Don't stop moving. Don't stop doing stuff. No door will open unless you keep trying to open doors. Peter was making the huge mistake of underestimating what Jesus can do by faith in him and his word. In Peter's mind, this is a waste of time because he approaches this matter from a natural, not a spiritual perspective. Since I say so much about young people, let me speak to the 16 over crowd. One of the things we don't have is a whole lot of time. The older you get, the more concerned you ought to be about how you use your time because you got far less time from 60 on than you have from zero to 60 because not too many people make it to 120. So I'm always concerned about what I'm investing my time in, and I'm a foresight kind of fellow. If I see something going to be a waste of time, I ain't bothered with it. Let me drop down to you younger sisters in your 20s and 30s. Tickety-tock, tickety-tock. Brother been talking to you. He ain't, he ain't taking you nowhere. He's stringing you along, baby. Maybe one day you done went from 18 to 28, and you still ain't got no ring. You better, you better, you better wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> Baby, don't waste my time. I'm sorry, that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> you see, Peter was approaching this from a natural, not a spiritual perspective. As an expert fisherman, Peter knew nighttime was the best time for fishing. They used with these large trammel nets. And the nets were such, made in such a way that if they threw them out during the day, the fish would see them. And if the fish saw them, then the, then the fish wouldn't go into the net because they, they fish, but they're not stupid. <laughs> the other problem was with these nets they only work in shallow water because the, the, they were so heavy that when you threw them out, if any fish were underneath, the nest just brought the fish down and you just scooped them up and took them. So you out in, in 40, 50 feet of water, you, you can't catch the fish either. So Jesus ain't making no sense. Clearly, he don't know what he's talking about. This man is telling us to go fish in the daytime and go out to the middle of the lake. This man don't know nothing about fishing. Brothers and sisters, faith comes when we take God His Word, whether we understand it or not. We are to walk by faith, not by sight. It's hard to work by faith when you see visual symbols of failure. Well, what do you mean? Well, for Peter, it was the empty net. For you, it may be an empty nest. Spouse gone. And after all that work with those kids, you got poor relationships with adult kids. Mm, I'll, I'll save that for another sermon. Some of you got empty pockets. You ain't got no money. I, I've had people, when I was unemployed, put money in the offering for me because they, they, they was just so ashamed for me. I've had that happen in my life. And for me, this was empty land. When this church started, back in 2003, four. when I say start, I'm talking about trying to get this one built, I would stand out. Just like you look to the north and you see all that empty land, that's how this whole half looked too. And I just couldn't see how God was going to do this. I couldn't see. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen, I'm mature as a saint. I'm 35 years into this. Part of what faith is about is that you can't see it. But that you are walking with God in such a way that the Spirit is moving on you so strong. See, a lot of people, I got I to gotta be honest now. If you want God to move on you like that, you got to get to the place where God is. Because God is in the light. You're not going to get to that kind of place and porno is your thing. 
I mean, you got to get to a place where you are dealing with holiness. You got to get to a place where you're dealing with righteousness. Why? Because God is a holy God and God is a righteous God. So if you want to get the mind of God, you got to walk in the light as He is in the light. And when you get to those kind of places, God will speak to you and tell you things you would have never even dreamed of. And God would just move through the wind, and I could feel him as I stood on the mounds of emptiness and say, there will be a church here. Now, he didn't tell me it'd be easy, but you sitting in it. So, don't tell me what God can't do. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus said to Peter, put out into deep water and let down, The Scripture says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Peter responds, I don't see it, but nevertheless, because the Lord said to not quit, I will let you overrule my doubts and do what the Lord said to do. Now, listen carefully about faith. See, we are taught sometimes that our faith is strong, so strong that we never have doubts. Well, if that's the definition of faith, then I'm disqualified for being up here. Y'all might as well get a new pastor. Because some of the greatest things that God has ever done in my life, I've had serious doubts as to whether it could get done. I'm just being honest with you. But the truth of faith is not about your doubts. The truth of faith is how you respond to what the Lord says. Do doubts rule you or does faith rule you? And when faith rules you, then you do what God says and you overrule your doubts. Am I helping somebody out here today? You see, ladies and gentlemen, there's more than one solution to a problem. See, so many people I deal with as a counselor, and I deal with, I don't care if I'm dealing with singles, I don't care if I'm dealing with marriage. I have learned something about so many people. So many people live off tunnel vision. They only see one solution to a problem. And because their scope is so limited, they never get answers because of the fact that they see one solution. You see, if all you've got is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Get them nails. Big nails. If all you got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. See, you need to find some other things to work with. See, what God is trying to tell you is some of your issues and problems, you are not going to get them solved with the hammer. The hammer ain't working. You need to find another way. And so what God is trying to tell you, the answer to things that you are going through ain't even entered your brain. How it's going to work has not even entered your brain. So you must trust in the Lord and let the Lord guide you, put down a hammer and try to see your issues, try to see your problems from another perspective that only God can show you. And when that's all said and done, let me tell you what happens. You look like a genius. You do. You look like a genius. The Lord said, ladies and gentlemen, our problem is this. We're always trying to figure out what God has already worked out. That's our problem. And the more intelligent you you are, the more degrees that you have, the more guilty you are of it. I know because I'm heavily degreed. BS accounting, certified public accountant, certified financial planner, masters of divinity. I'm an educated man. But the problem with education is this. You begin to think you know everything. See, you, don't, you, 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 don't, you know so much. But let me tell you something what true education will teach you. What true education will teach you that the more you know, the less you really understand about this world. That this world is so big. When, we, when my wife and I got to London, there were hundreds of thousands of people in the street. That just blew me away. How can you think you all that when you ain't nothing but one of seven billion people? That's all we are. How can we think we are that 
when we don't even know what's going on in other parts of the country, other parts of the world. You don't know what's going on on Jupiter. You don't know what's going on on Saturn. What we have to understand is that in walking with God, we realize our humility and understand we need God, not that God needs us. Peter, cast out your net. The rhema word was spoken. So many fish, the net began to break. Note, as I begin to close, in Luke chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. They signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. This went going from zero to now. You don't even got nothing to more than you can handle. Even their boats began to break. Yes, Peter, like us, he had mixed feelings. But he obeyed the master, and look what happened. To you, under the sound of my voice, don't quit. Don't quit. Help is on the way. Every day, as I said earlier, you can't seem to make ends meet. But the Lord said, I will supply all your need according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Some of you, under enormous loads of stress, and you feel in your mind and in your heart and your spirit, I just can't take anymore. But the Lord said, I will not put more on you than you can bear. I hope somebody's getting this rain of word down inside of them. Some of you have had plans for your life, and almost everything you plan, it almost seems to constantly fall apart. You want to quit. You want to give up. But the Lord said, the steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. Though he stumble, I will lift him up up and send him on his way. Some of you feel forsaken and lonely. A loved one that was irreplaceable in your life is gone. There's no getting that person back. But the Lord said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So that you may boldly tell others, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man can do unto me. Some of you, every door has been shut up in your face. You need healing. You need a job. Some of you have even contemplated suicide, which is the ultimate quit. But the Lord said, I will be an ever-present help in the time of trouble. If you really want to know that God exists, get in trouble. And then let God be the only way you can get out of the trouble. And when God becomes the only way that you can get out of the trouble and God sees you through it, then you will know that God is real. A ever-present help in the time of trouble. Tell your neighbor again, don't quit. Help is on the way.
Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Sunday services that are timely, biblically based, illustrative, and contemporary. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and the young at heart. We also invite you to join us for Tuesday night Bible study at 7.45 p.m. and lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708 283 0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org.